All right, should we, uh, oh, that's echoey. <laughs> All right, should we get going? So thanks for coming, everyone. I'm Greg. I am co-founder and CTO at Undo. I'm going to be talking today with Duang, who's a solutions architect with, uh, with Synopsys working on Coverity. And um, we're going to talk about some of the, uh, uh, some of the, the under the covers on advanced Linux C++ debugging tools. Um, so I'm going to go first, talk about some of the stuff that I know about, and then Duang is going to talk about what he knows about. Maybe if I come away from that, it'll go less echoey. Um, is it just me? It's a terrible echo. Is it, can everyone else hear the echo, or is it just me? Yeah. Is it, are both mics on, maybe? Is there anything we can do about that? It's just the room. All right, just the way it is. Okay. I'll try and get, I'll try and get past it. Okay. So I think debugging is our dirty secret as programmers, right? Most programmers spend most of their time finding and fixing bugs. And if you dispute that, just think, like, how often does it work first time? Right, what's the, I mean, I'd, I'd like to fancy myself as a, say, better, to be honest, better than average programmer. And what's the longest program I can write and it be complete, and it be correct straight off the bat? 10 lines? 30, maybe, if I'm, if I'm really careful and pushing it? And that's if it's a new program. If I'm changing an existing program, existing complex piece of code, then that number is, I think, depressingly close to zero lines of code that will be written without, without a bug, right? And it's really a whole the process is just trying to understand what happened, right? My program did something different from what I, was, what I was expecting it to do. Now, if you're a C++ programmer, as I guess most of us here are, then you, you, you've deliberately, you've chosen a language that's like very close to the metal, right? You must have a, a reason for choosing C++ over something higher level. Hopefully, that's a better reason than it makes you feel clever. Usually, it's like performance or something. But you're deliberately close to the metal. And you kind of need to know what's going on. And when you're debugging these systems, you need to know what's going on. And you need to use the tools that are available, right? And I think that's really, you can't be a really good programmer if you're not very good at debugging. And that means you have to use the tools that are available. But you kind of really need to know what the tools are doing as well. Because when, you know, when life gets really fun, when you get that kind of um, that sort of delicious mystery of like, the, the, the thing I'm observing can't possibly happen. Everything is just, I cannot have a, a model for what the hell is going on here. And then if the tools actually, if you misinterpret what the tools are doing, then that can even lead you astray and, and make it even worse, right? Um, so I think having a, a basic understanding of how these things work underneath is, is, uh, is essential. So I'm going to, I'd, I'd like to divide these tools up into these different kind of categories, right? The debugger, what we all think of, and I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that today. Not how to use it. I've done other talks on, on how to be, like, how to do lots of cool stuff in, in GDB, but how it works underneath. Uh, there's record and replay tools, which is like, obviously something that's close to my heart, where I'm from. Um, the dynamic checkers and, and static analysis, which Duang will talk about. So the, the, the debugger is really it's saying, what is my program doing, right? It's the ability to kind of freeze time. It's a bit like, you know, there was that, um, that style in, in, uh, in, in, in movies that was very popular, sort of popularized, I think, by uh, The Matrix, and then where, where they sort of freeze time and the camera kind of pans around and you can see everything kind of frozen. And then that style got copied by like everybody for a few years, including every commercial and everything. Well, that's kind of what I think of the debugger like. And you can see everything. And then time could just run again, right? And then you can stop again and have a look around. So it's very powerful at telling you what's my program doing right now. Um, whereas the record and replay tools, they really tell you, what did my program do? What happened? Now, there's a bit of overlap here, admittedly. Debuggers can, can give you a backtrace, which is kind of the best they can do about telling you how you got here. And obviously, that's very limited, but it can be very useful. Whereas we've got the, we can stick with my analogy of, of matrix uh, film direction. It's like you've got that ability with the, with the replay systems, you've got that ability to go and see everything from any angle you want, and like a, a time lord, you can sort of move time back and forth uh, to wherever you want to be and see everything uh, for any point in time. The checkers, really, they're about, did a class of a certain thing happen? Buffer overrun being the kind of canonical example, but there are all kinds of others to do with you know, race conditions or out of order lock acquisition or something like that. You're looking for instances of, did this specific thing happen when I ran my program? And the static checkers are saying, 
could this thing happen? They don't even have to run the program. Okay, so here's the you know so the big difference, of course, um, with the dynamic checkers. You have to. It won't tell you whether a buffer overflow might happen. You have to cause the buffer overflow in your testing or whatever in order to detect it. It can tell you where it happened, which of course is, is extremely useful. So let's get on with uh, with, with with GDB. I'm going to talk everything about, about GDB, but any Linux debugger will be working in basically the same way for, for the purposes of this talk. So this is LLDB or, or TotalView or whatever your, your, your debugger running on Linux, or indeed any Unix-like system is going to do basically the same thing. So you've got GDB, which is a process, right? Just a regular user-level process. Uh, doesn't have any special rights or anything. And that's talking to your program here. It's going to, we're going to call it Hello World, but whatever your program is. And it's over this kernel API called Ptrace, right, which is a really lousy interface. It's a horribly designed interface, but it's pretty powerful, and that's just like, that's what it is, so that's what, what we have to use. And then information goes back, or, or asynchronous notifications go back from the program to the debugger over, over signals. So let's just take a step back to how signals work. So on a, on a, on a Unix system, when a process receives a signal, a lot of the time, it's going to terminate. That's often the default, most often the default behavior, um, depending on what the signal was and how the system is configured. Maybe it, maybe it dumps core. If it's SIGINT, it won't. If it's SIGV, it might. Um, but maybe the program's been configured to ignore the signal, or maybe the default behavior of the signal is to be ignored. So, so signals like SIG, uh, SIG alarm, uh, its, its default behavior is ignore. Uh, or maybe the the default behavior is to stop the program. So signals like sig, sig tt out, sig tt in, or sig t stop, or sig stop, their default behavior is to, to, to stop the program. And if the program is so, so, so set things up, it can run a signal handler on receipt of the signal. And the other thing you might get is if your program is being p-traced, right? So if it has a tracer, then on receipt of a signal, it goes into a tracing stop, which looks very like a regular stop, you can see this if you look in um, proc pid status. You see the the the, the, um, the status of the of the process, and if it's t, that's a that's a that's a tracing stop. It means it's got a p, it's got a tracer and it's received a signal. So in this world, uh, so hello world here has it's received some kind of signal. Let's say it's sig alarm, whatever it is, doesn't matter, and it's now gone into this stopped state. So that's why I've shown it red. It's it's stopped, uh, and then. The debugger will continue it with ptrace cont, which then will unstop the target process and run it forward. Right? GDB calls the, the, the process being debugged the inferior, which I always think is a, is a lousy name, but that's what it calls it. But we can call it the target or the debuggy or however you want to think of it. So it calls ptrace cont, and that process now starts running until something happens, until actually it receives a signal. And when it receives a signal, it will go stop into that tracing stop, and the debugger gets notified. Actually, in my little diagram, I could have made GDB go red while the debug E was running, because that's while the, the inferior was running, because that's typically what happens. But it doesn't have to. And actually, you can run GDB in non-stop mode. There's nothing about, there's nothing about ptrace that requires it to stop. Typically, though, what it'll do is a wait pid call and stop waiting for that notification from the signal to come back. So signals only reach the tracee uh, if they're passed in via this ptrace cont call. So I said it was a lousy interface, and you can see proof of it here. So we've got this ptrace cont. The, the, the first argument of ptrace is, a, is an opcode. I think, by the way, if ever you find yourself writing a function whose first argument is some kind of opcode, um, then please don't. It should be several functions, in my view. But, but whatever, that's what ptrace looks like. Um, and you can see, obviously, it's completely uh, not type safe when you pass in these void stars. But the last argument there is sig alarm in this example. So that will actually deliver the sig alarm to the tracy. And if there's a signal handler for that, it will run. Or if there is, if it's a, if it's a something like a seg v and there isn't a signal handler, it will terminate um, the process. But the, 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 the tracy will only ever actually see the signal if it's passed in via ptrace cont or one of its friends, ptrace single step or ptrace syscall. Um, and if the, if the signal handler is blocked, then it will just mark the signal as pending. The handler won't run in that case. Um, and similarly, if it's set to ignore, um, it'll just be ignored. So breakpoints, when, when your target process hits a breakpoint, that's just a signal. That's a SIG trap, right? 
Um, now, if it's a breakpoint on x86, it will have, what the debugger will have done is poked into the text section a special instruction, which on, uh, on Intel is int3, I think we'll come to that in a bit, um, which generates a SIG trap, and then the debugger is notified in just the kind of the normal way. Um, likewise, control C, right? So if you run your program within GDB, and it's busy, and you hit control C, there's no special, like GDB's not, not, well, at least if it's not doing remote debugging, GDB's not special like in, in this way. It doesn't do anything particularly special. It's just that your, your, the, the program you're debugging, uh, it has a terminal, probably. And when you hit control C, the TTY for the controlling process group will send SIGINT to all of those processes. So the, the, the process that's being debugged gets stopped with a SIGINT, and then GDB gets notified of that effect, and then it drops down to the prompt, and you can do what you will. And so you can see this. Uh, so if I go uh, info signals. So here are, here's, here's the default behavior for all of the signals in, 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 in GDB. So you've got these different things you can say, whether it's going to stop or whether, it, and if you say no to stop, then when GDB sees a signal, it'll just feed it straight back in um, to the process. And whether it's going to tell the user, tell you the user that it's happened, or whether it's going to pass it in. So it doesn't have to, right? So that's the thing. When the, when the tracee gets the signal, the debugger, it's up, to the debu it's up to the tracer whether it's going to feed that signal back in. Usually it does, but in things like control C, which you can see here, it won't feed it back in, because most of the time that would just cause the program you're debugging to terminate, right? So this is my attempt at the, at the Unix signal algorithm. I think this is roughly right. I'm almost certain there'll be some kind of exceptions to it. But so sig kill and sig stop are special. You cannot uh, set a signal handler for either of them. You cannot block them. You cannot ignore them. So if, you, if a process gets a sig kill, even if it's being traced, right? even if it's being p-traced, even if it's being debugged, when it gets a sig kill, that's it, game over. The program is terminated. It becomes a zombie until, it's, until, it, until that result is reached. Um, otherwise, if it's a sig stop, the process will go into a, a stop state. Again, you can't, ca you can't have a signal handler for SIG stop. You can't mask it. You can't ignore it. Otherwise, if the process is being traced, it goes into this tracing stop. Actually, if it's a, this is not quite right. If it's a SIG stop and it's being traced, it still goes into a tracing stop. So that's a useful signal that debuggers will often use when they want to stop the target process because you can know, as a debugger writer, you can know that it doesn't matter what the what the target's done in terms of masking the signals or setting signal handlers or ignoring signals. It can't mask SIG stop, it can't ignore it, so it's gonna do what you want. Um, likewise, then you go if it's blocked or ignored or is a handler, otherwise the last thing we do is terminate the process. So ptrace has a whole bunch of uh, operations. So ptrace cont we've already seen. Single step runs it forward one instruction. You can run forward to a syscall, get and set registers, and uh, peek and poke uh, memory and, and, and all that stuff. There's about a whole bunch, I'm not gonna get into all the details and what it does, but it's quite rich. If you run with uh, ptrace syscall, that's kind of like ptrace cont, but it stops when the process issues a system call. Actually, it stops twice, once on the way into the system call and once on the way out. Um, and on x86, there's a nasty hack where you can, in, you can inspect the AX register. If it's minus 38, that means it stopped on the way in. Minus 38 is enosys, so there's no way that a system call can actually return enosys. So that's why they picked that, that, that magic value. I believe on other architectures, um, there's no way to tell whether it's on the way in or the way out. You just, as a tracer, you just need to count. Um, here's a certain thing that I, you know, so I'd been writing to the ptrace interface for, I'm a bit embarrassed to say this, but for multiple years before I figured out that what happens with syscall restart. So the kernel does a really good job at kind of hiding this and making it all transparent nearly all the time. Uh, so, when, a, when, when the process gets stopped, it goes into one of these, um, these, these tracing stop states that I spoke about. It's, it, let's say it's in deep in a read system call or something. It's blocked reading data from the network, and you do control C, and it goes into a tracing stop. Actually, it doesn't stop inside, deep inside the kernel. It percolates all the way back out. The system call returns to user space, and it's at the time the system call returns to user space, then it becomes stopped. Uh, and, and if you think back to the uh, original version, earlier versions of Linux that had the big kernel lock, this was kind of needed, right? Because otherwise, 
the, well, you wouldn't be able to do anything if it was stuck in the, in the kernel holding the lock, and that's still the way that it works today. It returns back to user space, but before executing any code in user space, then it's in that stopped state. And uh, it has a special magic return code, uh, it, it, something like e-restart e sys, as I think minus 512 through to minus 516 um, of these e-restart e, e sys and, and friends. And this is a special return code that tells the kernel when it next gets a ptrace cont, when it's going to be continued, it's going to magically re-enter the system call and restart it. And most of the time, it will do the right thing with timeouts and things, so it doesn't reset the timeout to what it was. Um, so you should never see a system call return e-restart sys as in user space code. Uh, should never see, but there are bugs, especially in, uh, in, in, in certain versions of, of kernels. One that can be, I think, most problematic is the um, RHEL 6 uh, kernels and CentOS 6 and, and, and the like, where there was actually, I said ptrace is this lousy interface. There was an attempt to make it better um, with a thing called utrace, which then was going to be a new interface, and then ptrace would be a kind of personality onto that. Um, and Red Hat adopted it and put it all into RHEL 6 kernels, but it never made it, um, and that's kind of died, that, 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 that attempt. Um, and that implementation was a bit iffy. So if you're debugging a process, you might see a function, you might see a system, particularly on RHEL 6, you might see a system call return e restart sys. That's not what really happens. That's an artifact of the fact that you're ptracing it in, 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 your, in, your, in your debugger. Um, I mentioned this earlier, just touching this earlier. The breakpoints on x86, at least, is this int3 instruction. It's a magic single byte instruction. So int is to raise an interrupt. And usually on x86, uh, int raise an interrupt is two bytes long the interrupt opcode and the 0 to 255 interrupt number that you're raising. But a two byte breakpoint instruction would be problematic if you have a single byte instruction on which you're trying to place a breakpoint, right? Otherwise, your program could end up branching into the middle of that instruction. So there's a magic bytecode OXCC. The debugger puts that in. You should never see it, right? Because the, the, the debugger will, uh, um, when you look at the, the, the memory, the debugger will take that out. But um, if your program, for whatever reason, is reading its own code, you might, you might observe it when those breakpoints are set. When an int3 instruction is executed, the kernel stops the process with a SIG trap and you get all the usual thing you see. There's also hardware watch points, which obviously are very, very useful, right? So that you, can you can watch data and, get a, and trigger a trap when that data is changed. Um, those are set by the debug registers on x86. I'm setting everything in x86 terms, but most architectures have some equivalent of this. Um, DB0 to 7, actually four of them are for addresses, the other are control registers, so you can set up to four at a time. You can set them to trap or memory reads or writes um, or executes, actually, so you can implement breakpoints using the debug registers if you really don't want to write to the code, but there aren't very many of them available. And um, you, don't, you don't write to them directly from the program. So it's configurable on x86, but I think Linux means you'll get a fault if you try to access the debug registers directly from your program, but the debugger will do it via ptrace poke user uh, command. OK, um, so now we've got this. Let's get on to a bit more. That's how kind of the ptrace interface Let's go on to dwarf info now and, and how our, our debug information is represented. And I suspect we've all kind of fallen foul of this at some point. So debugging with attributed record formats, that's a kind of strange acronym. And I was unsurprised when I looked it up earlier to learn that it is, in fact, a backronym. And it's called dwarf because it was made at the same time as the ELF format was made. And they decided that would be kind of cool. Um, so it doesn't really, it's not really what it stands for. But anyway, it, 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 it contains the debug info. It contains a description of your program that the debugger can read to give you that kind of symbolic information. So at the simplest level, it will map a program counter to a source line. So when your program is stopped at program counter you know, OX1234, the debugger can look in the dwarf information and see, oh, yeah, that corresponds to foo.c line 42. But it contains all sorts of information as well, uh, you know, and, and, and all the type information, classes, templates, all kinds of things that the debugger might want to know. Um, You can, here are some useful, uh, useful options. So minus G is the default one. That's the easiest one to get debug info. But actually, that defaults to minus G2. So minus G is like minus O. You give it a number afterwards to specify different levels. And default dash G is, is, is level 2. You can go dash G3 to get um, everything, which generally I think is, I recommend. It's just generally useful, dash G3. Um, it's independent, completely orthogonal to the optimization level. 
But obviously, the more aggressively the compiler has optimized your code, the more quirky your experience might be when you come to, 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 to debug it. You know, it's not laid out linearly, and so you can think you're going forwards, but you jump back. And, but dash OG is a useful optimization level, so good, good op sensible optimizations, but, but nothing too crazy, so you get a sensible debug experience. But often you're trying to debug, you know, you're trying to debug production code, and you want to do that with full optimizations, and, and, you, and you can, um, and it does the experiences. Um, obviously, your, your, your experience will, will vary, but we'll talk a bit about that right now. So one of the most annoying things when you're debugging optimized code, oh, by the way, if you do, if you do dash G3, one of the nice things it will do is all the inlined functions, it will kind of make that all go away. So as you're stepping through, it will mostly look like inlined functions are not inlined, which is very helpful. Um, but yeah, you try and print a variable and you get, and you get variable optimized out, right? So we've all seen that, I expect. So let's have a look at what this means. So, so here's a little program that I'm going to compile with optimizations. Uh, and when we load it up, and so here I am at the beginning of my, uh, of my program, line seven, and if I print foo, it says variable optimized out. I think this is a really unhelpful error message because it kind of implies, to me at least, that that just doesn't exist anymore. The, the compiler's been able to get rid of foo completely. It's not what it means here. What it means here is, it's not live, but it hasn't actually been optimized away. If I do a next and then print foo, et voila, there it is, all right? So let's look at what that actually, how that all works and what GDB is doing. So if I look at um, read elf minus debug dump. So this is, this, this shows us the dwarf information, right? So dwarf is this file format, it's fairly simple really and it's just this tree of objects, and there are tags, which are kind of the nodes of the tree, and it, the tree structure, as you might imagine, from your program layout and, and, and uh, nested blocks of code and types, you know, structures with structures and classes and templates and all that, all put together in this tree, a bit, little bit like an AST, but not quite. Um, and here's everything. Of course, this has got everything that I've included, all the type definitions and everything, so, so GCC can describe that. If you remember, my variable was called foo, so let's have a look at that. So here's foo, um, and it tells me you know, where, where, where it is. So it's in file number one, which will be indexed elsewhere to optimized.c, the file name and the line number and everything, and the type, of course, and it has this. It has a locations list, and this defines where foo is, is live, and I can actually look at that. I can, slightly simpler view. I can go debug dump equals lock and get just the locations list. Now, this program is very small, so this is obviously quite small. So here's the locations list starting at A. It's actually a list, the full list, and he did, these are the ranges where foo is available, right? So if I go back, let's look at the function. So I can see from the disassembly, it's never actually uh, writing foo, the, writing that foo value to, to memory. It doesn't need to. Rand returns it. It's in register AX. And, uh, uh, and it just keeps it in a register. But the dwarf info, that's fine. It can tell us that, right? It can tell us that at these lines, it seems to have a zero uh, size range here, so I'm not sure what that's all about. But from here, from, from, from offset 1074 to 1078, if I look here, so I can see here it is. Here's the 074 to 078. And uh, uh, it's telling, it tells the, the, the debugger that the values there in, in in register RAX, and actually it pops around different registers here, and it's actually telling us, I think, well, I haven't actually confirmed this, but I think what this means is the value foo is what's in RAX plus one, right? Because my code, if you remember, did foo plus plus. Um, and then at the end, it's just in RAX because that's the value that gets, that gets returned. So modern versions of the compiler and modern versions of GDB uh, or whatever debugger you're using are able to do an okay job, at least, pretty good job, of tracking, you know, tracking values through register states just as long as they're live. Now, of course, if you're using reversible debugging, it's even better because you can go back to when it was live, when it's kind of become unlive. Um, but, but even if you're using a regular debugger, often you can just step forwards a bit and find out what, your, uh, uh, what, your, what those values are. There's a nice little tour of uh, Dwarf and, and, uh, and all that good stuff. So you can tell, these are all GCC options, by the way, so you can tell 
GCC quite a bunch of things, but actually, if you just put dash G3, it kind of does everything. Even macros, actually, which is quite cool. Let me just quickly show that. So, so if I go dash, just dash G uh, on here, and I load that up, and I start, and I print val, it goes, well, I don't know what val is, right? Because it says preprocessor macro. It hasn't gone through the compiler. But if I go dash G3 and repeat, ta-da, it knows about macros. So particularly useful when you've got macros that sort of expand, you can um, sort of part, can, can convert you know, data structures into to extract the bits, the bit fields out of data structures or whatever, if that, when that's done by macros, which sometimes it is, that's quite useful. Obviously, you shouldn't be using macros, but maybe you're trying to debug someone else's code. Now, related, related to dwarf format is uh, uh, stack information, CFA and CFI, which is uh, call frame address and information, respectively. So depending on how you compile things, you may or may not have frame pointers. And in the modern world, you, more than likely you don't. Any optimization on 64-bit Intel, the compiler will take away frame pointers so it can use the RBP register as a useful general purpose register. And this means walking the stack is slightly painful. Um, but you know it's worth it for the, for the extra register that you get. And so with the CFA, um, uh, and CFI, what you get is essentially a mapping of, at this, for every program counter or range of program counters, what offset from the stack pointer is the beginning of my stack frame, right? And then that can be, so then you can use that to do print your backtrace or, or, or see it, and that's on the CFA, and with CFI, you get more stuff like locals and everything else. And actually, the, um, the exception uh, unwinding mechanism and C++ will use some of this stuff. So it's kind of related, but, but, but different from Dwarf. Uh, as, this is, as this is a C++ conference, let's just do a little bit of C++. Um, so catch point's pretty cool in GDB. They let you stop at the breakpoints, obviously stop, but at a certain, at a certain given, at a given line. Catch points can let you stop when, when kind of interesting things happen. So here's my bit of C++ code, uh, minus G3, uh, so, so let's, uh, so I can go uh, catch, uh, throw, exception, and that will catch any time the exception, exception is thrown. I can also catch, catch, which is a bit mouthful, but catch is the catch. Uh, and if I look at what it's done, it's actually inserted just a couple of breakpoints, and and it's given me handily the address here. So I can look at that. If I look at that address, uh, info line, that we can see. Sure enough, that's at the CXA throw uh, 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 label, and unsurprisingly, that's a catch, right? So these are these are routines within the, the C++ library, which the exception mechanism will jump into when it's throwing and catching exceptions, and then the G GDB will put breakpoints on there, and then can filter on the exception type and and, and all that good stuff. Um, you can also catch syscall, which uses the ptry syscall thing, right? So you can say catch all syscalls, or catch a certain syscall, and run forward until that syscall happens. Um, Threads are kind of interesting in the debugger world. So the thread library, it's, it's a, this is all kind of pointless these days because pretty much every threaded C++ program on Linux is going to be using just libpthread and it's all kind of standard. But it's designed such that you can have different threading libraries. And in years gone by, that was actually more common that you would do that. So the threading library provides this libthreadDB, where DB stands for debugger. And that provides different routines that the debugger can call to look up things like thread local storage. So when you try and print Erno, and just in a regular C program, um, that will actually go through libthreadDB if it's threaded program because Erno is thread local. And GDB does that kind of all automatically for you. Um, just a little uh, plug. Um, 
I'm putting together a, a, a series of small kind of bite-sized five, 10 minute um, tutorials on all kinds of things GDB. Um, so it's kind of a lot of content from previous talks, but a lot of new stuff as well. So you might want to go and look at our wittingly uh, named GDB Watchpoint series for more of that kind of stuff. Enough of uh, GDB and the debugger. Let's talk about um, dynamic checkers. And we're talking about uh, address sanitizer and Valgrind here. There are, of course, many others. They're all kind of, they, both address sanitizer and Valgrind work on this. They have this, this notion of shadow memory, right? What they want, so back up a bit. What we're trying to do here is detect invalid memory accesses at a much finer grain than the hardware will allow, right? So obviously with modern systems, you've got pages, typically 4K might be, you know, might be, might be much bigger than that. And that's your kind of the, the granularity with which you can mark uh, memory um, as, uh, as accessible or not. And what we're trying to do with both Valgrind and Address and Tanitizer is do that at a much finer grained you know, per sort of object level, much finer grain than the hardware will support. So what they do is create this, this shadow uh, uh, map. So the memory, every chunk of memory, does this work? No, not really. Every chunk of memory will map down to the shadow. The shadow is a smaller bit because it only needs a few bits of information for every, say, eight byte word. So the shadow is smaller than the memory it, it, it shadows typically. Um, and it just has sort of information about whether this, so that way, both address sanitizer and Velgrind can look up is this address valid or not? Now, Valgrind works with, a, with binary JIT translation, right? So you can just take your program compiled, however it's compiled. Maybe you don't even have the source code to it, and you can run it through Valgrind, and, and, and it does it through JIT translation. The sanitizers work by changing the compiler. These have different trade-offs, of course. It's nice that you don't have to change the application, change the way you compile with Valgrind. It does mean it is quite slow, um, and there are certain things you can't do. So address sanitizer, because the compiler is generating the, 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 the checks um, for, uh, around each memory access, it can, um, it can do more stuff, right? So one of the things it can do that, that Valgrind isn't able to do is detect um, buffer overruns on the stack. And the, and the runtime overhead is, is much less. Um, so they report typically around sort of 50% to 100% slowdown. So it's still you know, very real and measurable, but it's much less than you'd get with something like Valgrind. But what both techniques are doing is every chunk of memory has this has these red zones at the beginning and the end, right? And and so if you do a malloc of a certain size, I mean anyway, if you do a malloc of say 32 bytes, actually the system's going to allocate more than 32 bytes because it's got some bookkeeping information that needs to go with that malloc chunk. But if you do it with um, uh, with Valgrind or with uh, address sanitizer, they they have their own mallocs, they intercept malloc, and they make it even bigger, and they put these red zones at the beginning and the end. Um, which, uh, uh, and, and then through the shadow maps, these red zones are marked bad, right? So if your memory, if your program touches these, it knows it's, it's a problem. One thing to be aware of, of course, is the, 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 the smaller the red zone, then the, if you, if you uh, stretch over the buffer with a certain stride, you're gonna, you can go right over this, the red zone and it won't notice. So bigger red zones will catch more types of errors, but of course consume more memory. So that's it for uh, the sanitizers. Let's get in now to uh, uh, record and replay systems and something sort of close, close to my heart. So as I say, it's, a, it's, a, it's this sort of control of time. It's being able to see exactly what happens. I think we have time where I can just show a very quick demo of this, if you will indulge me. Um, is that readable? Just about, is that, is that, well, maybe not at the back. Let me, uh, I think there's a, I can figure this out. But I haven't got any, uh, oh, that's not doing what I wanted it to do. All right. I don't know. That's not done what I wanted. Never mind. Let's go into normal mode. So here I've got a little program, and I'm going to run the program inside uh, the debugger, go onto the VPN so I can get. Uh, license. Okay, that's from the, let's get rid of that from the previous time around this little demo. So apologies if you've seen this demo before, but I just want to show what we mean by record and replay or reversible debugging. So I'm going to run my program and it's crashed. 
and I come through a cert zero. Right, well, what's gone, let's have a look at what's gone on here. So I've called this function cash calculate, which given a number is supposed to return its square root, and I've given it 255 and it's returned zero. So clearly cash calculate has returned the wrong thing. Um, I can see from my stack trace here down here, I'm not actually in my code at cert zero. The debugger's nice, kindly put me there, but actually it's in this uh, raise function here that the, where the program has stopped. All so far so normal. It, so you know you can do that with a regular um, debugger. Just looking at, as I said earlier, looking at the stack trace is kind of the, the, the closest that most debuggers give you to like, how did I get here? Um, but I need to know what happened inside this function, right? Cache calculate returned the wrong thing. I need to know why. So what I'm going to do is hit this button here, which is like an uncall, which is kind of popping up the call stack, but rather than guessing, it's really moving back. My program has definitely been here. All the, ver all the globals and everything are being, go back to what they were. And now I can start to step back through time. And now if I go here, this is right after cache calculate returned. So I can go in to the function and I can see what it returned and why. So it's returned the ith entry from the cache. I here is 88. So this looks like typical programmer's worst nightmare. Sure enough, my cache contains bad data. My cache tells me that the square root of 255 is zero. So someone stomped on my cache. I've got no idea how or when that happened. Is it a logic error? Is it a memory error? I don't know. Well, what I'm going to do here is add a watch point. Normally, you'd set a watch point. I'm going to make this watch point persist across stack frames. Normally, you'd set a watch point and run forward until the data changes. I'm going to run backwards until that data changes. And that's going to take me back to the line of code that's, that's where that happened, the smoking gun. So I've gone back in time. I've gone back in time to where the structure contains good data. Um, actually, I can now step forward. Watch the data here as I step forward. This is, we'll see, this is like watching uh, uh, live action uh, uh, replay. We're watching sports on TV or something. So I, as I step, 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 that's it. That's the corruption happening right there. Let's just back up a bit and see if we can see what's, what's going on. So writing square root adjacent and operand adjacent into my cache, and I can see here that, that uh, uh, operand adjacent is minus one. So I've tried to take the square root of negative one, you can't do that with integers, hence, the, hence that's garbage. Well, what's going on there? Why has that happened? Well, let's just add another watch point to that and go back again. And OK, it's being set here. So operand adjacent is being set to operand minus 1. Operand is 0. So what the, the program tried to be smart, it's tried to populate one entry either side in the, in, in the cache. Um, and that's called a, when it called the function, it returned the right thing. It called the function with an argument of 0, and it returned 0, as it should have. But by being smart with this locality of reference, it's, it's, it's left one entry in the cache in a bad state, and I didn't notice for some time later. So that's kind of what you can do with these replay systems. Um, so essentially what we're saying here is you can go back to any instruction that executed, and you can see any piece of state, right? Any, any, any value, any piece of memory, any register value for any instruction that executed, which clearly is just a huge amount of data for anything but the tiniest of programs, right? So clearly, we can't store all of that. Even if we tried to store just the diff, just the delta between what's changed each instruction, that would still be way too much information, right? Billions of instructions operating every second. You know, it's an 8, 16, 32-byte record every, every, every nanosecond, roughly. That's just not going to be practical either. So what we do, and this is true for, for um, RR and for Live Recorder, what, what we do is to just capture the non-deterministic stimuli and exploit the natural determinism of computers. So when I'm stepping, stepping back in that demo, what's happening under the hood is it's going back to a snapshot and playing forwards to where it needs to be, right? And so we're recomputing previous states rather than trying to store everything. Now, for that to work, then we need to capture those sources of non-determinism, right? Computers are completely deterministic except when they're not. And for a, a, a user mode application, we've got several sources of this non-determinism, namely system calls, thread switches, signals, asynchronous signals at least. Uh, some instructions are non-deterministic. So read the timestamp counter as an example. In modern Intels also have a get me a random number instruction. Um, and shared memory access is shared with the process or shared with the device or something. Um, so we have, so we just, but we just need to capture those, which is typically a tiny, tiny subset of what the program is doing. And everything else can be, can be recomputed. Now, there's another problem, though. Sort of like we need to know where we are in time when we're replaying. So when, I'm, you know, when that demo steps forward a line, it has to stop at the right time. And if it's inside a loop, you can't use the program counter because loops, right? So you have to know how far through the program we are, not just so that we can step 
nicely with the reverse step and things, but so that we can replay signals and other asynchronous non-deterministic events at exactly the right time, right? So the problem with this kind of technology is that if you get it even slightly wrong, everything unravels very quickly. And it's sort of like the, it, it's very kind of, you've got to get everything. You've got to capture and replay perfectly every single bit at precisely the right time. So RR is built on uh, performance counters, right? So modern CPUs, at least modern Intel CPUs, uh, have uh, sufficiently accurate performance counters to count the number of retired taken branches um, uh, that they can give you an accurate time of how far you are through the program, and these can be, these can be exploited. So they're nice and fast. Um, the, the program runs without instrumentation. Nice and simple. You don't have to write um, too much code to take advantage of them. Um, the only thing is they're not always available, so they don't work on um, AMD CPUs. They're not always available in the cloud. Uh, they don't work on ARM. But where they are available, they're, they're, they're very good. But they also can't capture everything. So things like um, uh, 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 shared memory accesses and, and asynchronous uh, 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 operations are, are problematic. Um, and they use the, the thing called the precision event-based sampling PEBS in order to generate a, an interrupt. So I don't in, only need to know exactly where I am in the program. I need to be able to go back to a precise state in the program. And you can configure the uh, Intel performance counters to generate an interrupt after a certain number of things have happened, right? And so that's how they do that. Whereas with, with Live Recorder, which is from, from Undo, uh, we use a JIT and we binary translate the, 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 uh, the, the machine code as it's running, um, which does impose more overhead, um, but does have the advantage of not relying on these things that aren't always there and can cover cases like shared memory and, and asynchronous stuff. But, that, but, but basically, they're, they're kind of the same, but they're just using different techniques to get the same information uh, that, we, that we need. So that's it for my very quick run through of those various uh, types of tools. I'd now like to hand over to Duang, who's going to talk about uh, covariety uh, static analysis. Okay. All right, before I start, a uh, real quick question for you guys. Uh, what do you think would be the coolest way to make money for C++ programming? Inheritance, of course. It's free <laughs> and efficient, right? <laughs> uh, okay, well, this section I'm going to talk about static uh, analysis. Uh, like Greg said, uh, I work for Synoptis and uh, I support the product uh, Covarity, the static analyzer. Uh, so, what do static analyzers do? Well, what they do is uh, they take source code, okay, uh, in case of uh, languages like C, C. They will compile them and then generate a semantic representation that includes an abstract syntax tree, uh, various uh, call graph elements, right? And then compute, you know, different paths and then go through those paths and find problems in your code, right? So all of this is computed and this is done statically and it's not during runtime, right? So when it finds problems, uh, they will present, I, I know it's not readable, it's okay. Like in red, it's like annotation of steps which uh, leads to the ultimate problem uh, in your code. Yeah, and then the, these defects are very consumable in various formats. Uh, if you are running the static analyzer on command line, you know, print on the command line. Uh, if you're using some IDE, the analyzer can often be driven inside your IDE, so, so your code will be uh, overlaid with the problems they find. Uh, it's pretty trivial to push the results into code reviews, pull requests, right? Um, and, you know, there are quite a few static analyzers um, in our industry. And so the way I kind of like to think about static analyzer is this way. I mean, what is the main motivation behind that static analyzer and whether that analyzer automatically is your friend or not, okay? So there, there's a group of them where their attempt is to find anything that can potentially go wrong with your code, okay? Where the false positive rate can be as high as 80 to 90%. So that class of set, set analyzer is typically used mostly for uh, security researchers, okay? So they need to look at all possibilities, find the research, and then kind of uh, find the needle in a haystack, right? So if you are using static analyzer today and you end up uh, facing with too many false positives, just remember that's not your friend. Because if you are triaging everything that's in there, 
you're kind of doing the work of the security researcher, right? Then you don't have time to code, okay? And I also, the other class is what's already built in when you're compiling with your, with your tool chain. Uh, I say those are your friend, uh, but I think they're typically focused on trying to get you something quick right there, right? Um, and then I would say the last class of um, static analyzers, they tend to be much more conservative. Right, they gotta have very strong evidence before they um, put it into a report that it's a defect. Yeah, and I would say that class, make that your best friend. Um, so um, I'll quickly go through this. So I don't know if you uh, read this paper, this is back in 2002, Linux kernel version 2.2, uh, research work at Stanford, uh, where they uh, created, this was the original version of Kubernetes actually, uh, they found 200 some or several hundred very important uh, defects in the Linux kernel. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is like many, many years ago. So since then, we have come a really long way. The Linux kernel team still uses Kubernetes today pretty judiciously. Actually, I should ask anybody here work on the kernel? Okay, we have a hand there. Oh, actually, we should give him a round of applause. <laughs> because... Uh, that community, they're kind of my heroes, right? If you look at our planet, that's probably one of the most important code bases, you know, uh, we have, yeah? But uh, it's very public. If you, if you go into Git log and then do a keyword search on Coverity, you'll see thousands of references of Coverity. Uh, they like Coverity, they give credit to Coverity when they're fixing stuff based on what Coverity has found from them. So um, you'll see this uh, table right here. Um, on the left column is a list of uh, checkers. So these are uh, top checkers in terms of total number of issues that team has fixed. And I pulled this data um, back earlier this year, March 2019. So you'll see like the third one, dead code. Uh, that usually means like you have a if some logical expression and then there's a blocker code, right? But if that logical expression can never ever uh, return true, then that blocker code becomes dead code, right? So that means the developer has made a mistake in their, um, in their thinking, yeah? Um, so you can see that for dead code, the kernel team has fixed 968 to date, right? Uh, 64 dismissed, right? So 486 outstanding. So outstanding usually, based on what I know, is usually in areas where they don't care that much, right? But you, the, the thing that I wanna highlight for you guys is the dismiss rate itself. It's, it's really low. Okay, yeah, so if you guys are using a static analyzer, have this kind of rate, remember that that's your friend, okay? Um, so now I wanna get under the hood a little bit um, about static analysis. So on the left-hand side is example code where it's, uh, it's being annotated uh, uh, with, with a problem. And on the right-hand side is actually an example checker. Um, it's a domain, you know, it's a functional language. Uh, Coverity has actually recently started opening up the analysis engine, the AST, the, the call, uh, call graph to developers. So then you can create your own uh, custom analysis, uh, if you will. Okay, so I'll walk you guys through. Um, so on the left, right, this is a, a very simple problem. We have malloc here, right? We have a... Uh, uh, if it's odd or even number here, just kind of random. If it's odd, then we will free um, uh, the allocated memory, right? Otherwise, when it, uh, w when it goes out of scope, you know, then you have a leak, okay? So let's have a look at, uh, to see how the checker looks like. Um, so the way, uh, the way to think about this is to say, okay, I'm gonna define a pattern uh, where uh, it is, a step in the call graph, okay? And then where it's a function call, the function uh, identifier is malloc, okay? And then similarly, we're gonna look for a step in the call graph where it's a call to free, where the function identifier is free, okay? Ignore the rest, it's, uh, um, okay? And then, now if you think about this, we really need to match the allocation versus the free, right? You cannot just take random allocation and random free and where they don't line up, right? Uh, they don't re reference the same object of memory, right? So the trick is to line up the paths where the 
object you, you care about uh, uh, is lined up, yeah? So uh, there's a feature in our code XM where we could say the called expression uh, E, whatever the, the pointer is, becomes the key, okay? Uh, so then, and then here's the checker itself now. So I can give the name uh, to the checker, right? And then so then what the checker does is to say, okay, for all functions in global set, so it's just all functions, where uh, all paths involving the function where it matches the sequence. Right? You have at one point alloc, and then this uh, arrow looking thing, uh, this can be, uh, can be chained together, so if you have uh, multiple call sequences you care about, and then where there is no call to free. Right? Easy enough, right? Okay. Um, Okay, so before I get to before I get to the, the demo, I just want to give you um, uh, a flavor for like you know why or when you might use something like this, right? Um, so I was working with a uh, customer, really big cloud company. They have a security policy to say anything that goes into storage must be encrypted, right? So you can imagine how to uh, implement a checker similar to this, right? then is to start with function patterns where, the, oh, five more minutes, okay. Uh, so the use case will be very simple, where if, if you track all the operations where you can cause a write to, uh, to storage, right, and then you look up in the uh, call graph that, that's where this function exists, and then if there's an uh, encryption operation, right? And then furthermore, you wanna make sure that the encryption happens to the same object. Now you lined up. So every pass that comes through that does not have that encryption done, then that's a problem, right? Um, so like if you are doing code reviews, right, you're, you're frequently catching people or you see review comments like, don't do this or don't do that, don't do this in this context or, or, or whatnot, that's a good time uh, to use something like this, okay? So uh, really quick on demo, so you can see how this looks. So, uh, this is command line. So Coverity has a build wrapper called code build, where we say uh, uh, this is where we want to put the capture code, and then you can put the, uh, uh, the compile command like this. this. Something on the screen. Oh. Okay, great. All right. So um, I would hit a command like this. Uh, so the build. Um, the build wrapper will monitor the compile, so anything that gets compiled, it will pick up. And Coverity understands all the compile flags, and then so it knows how to compile and generate the semantic representation that's exactly equal to your code. So like this CL, this uh, is comp Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, is this better? <sighs> Apologize. Okay, is that better? Okay. So you could replace the CL here with CMake, Maven, or whatever build you have. So everything that that's, uh, gets touched will automatically pick it up. So um, so in this case, I only have one um, compile. So uh, we can, you can see it there. So then we can do cough analyze just like that. So here it will compute the um, call graphs and ASC and all that and then run the analysis. So this resource leak is, is a, a default checker that's, that comes with Coverity. So I already found that. So, uh, so the question is how do we uh, trigger that custom checker I showed you earlier? So we do this. So I'm gonna disable all the default checkers that comes with Coverity. 
and I'm going to uh, just enable that particular custom checker uh, I showed you earlier. OK. And then uh, if I want to look at um, the issue locally, And you'll see that uh, the checker name here, right, uh, came from the custom checker. So, yeah. And uh, notice, right, you get several things automatically. You'll notice that uh, in this particular branch, where if it's taking the false branch, that's when you when you go out of scope, you're gonna have the leak, right? You notice I didn't do anything that had to do with this uh, conditional branch right here, right? That's because Coverity in the background, when it computes all these paths, uh, that path already pre-computed. So when I, when I express that this is a particular sequence I care about, uh, I don't need to worry about these different paths, right? So it, it knows how to evaluate this I mod two equals one, for example. Yeah? Okay. Yep. So, so that's, Static analysis. Uh, yeah. Thanks, yeah. Durang. Thanks, everyone. I don't know if we have time for one or two really quick questions. I'm seeing a sign. Session is over. But yeah. All right. So we're over. But uh, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.